I'm going to read verse 18. This is Paul, the apostle, speaking. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Present suffering is a reality. Paul says there is suffering at the present moment. And it is a reality in our present life. Suffering was a reality to Apostle Paul himself. He wasn't somebody talking about it. He felt what suffering was. He experienced suffering multiple times through his ministry. In fact, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, here the apostle tells us just some of his life experience that will let you know that he was a man that knew what suffering was all about. Turn there with me and let's look at it quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 27. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. This is Paul speaking. In labor, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In debt, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the seas, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, Sleep, sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. How is that for experience of one man? So, to Paul that is writing this passage, he knows what suffering is. And what Paul is saying to you and to me this morning is, for me, suffering is a reality. Maybe you didn't catch everything I read. Let me reread it in a different way. He was in prison many times. He was beaten with scourges, 39 latches. This, if you have watched, watched the, the Passion of Christ, and you see there where Jesus was being whipped, that is the most horrendous part of the movie that some people will close their eyes. 39 lashes. Paul said he had that five times in his lifetime. Now, these were beatings that some people would die while they are beating them. This man didn't die the first time. He didn't die the second time. He went through that five times. Can you imagine what his body will, what would be left of his body the first time? He said, I've been through it five times. Not only that, he was beaten with rod three times. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was constantly in danger. He experienced sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, fasting, cold, nakedness. His life was always in his hand, always in danger, and he was a man of God. So suffering was a part of Apostle Paul's life. The first point I wanted to get this morning is that, yes, the sufferings cannot be compared to what is coming. The suffering is going to be followed by glory, but the first thing is the suffering right now is for real. Suffering was a reality for early believers, Stephen was murdered. He was the first Christian to be put to death because of his faith. The Jerusalem church was scattered. Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Acts 8 verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death, the death of Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judah and Samaria, except the apostles. The early Christians knew exactly what suffering was. Can you imagine anything happening now and you have to flee your house at a moment's notice? They all fled for their lives. Why? Because they are believers. They knew what suffering was. Apostle James was killed by King Herod. After that, he stretched for his end and imprisoned Peter. You're talking about suffering? Yes, they know it. What about? Suffering to the point of death. 
Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John. It's one thing to suffer and still be alive. This man not only was apprehended, he was killed. Can you imagine what would have happened to the rest of the church? God forbid, imagine somebody coming here and say, well, you are all Christians, and, and like what happens outside, and I say, well, where is your pastor? I'm taking him. That's what happened to them. You, you say, well, God may never be born. It happened to the church. Where is God? Yeah, God was there. He was not sa satisfied with that. And verse 3, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he, pro he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of the unliving bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squares of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people at Passover, after Passover, to kill him, just like he killed James. So suffering was a reality to the people of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Believers endured great persecutions. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. And one more thing. See what Jesus said about the church of Smyrna. This, 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 this will make you feel perplexed to a degree. We have Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This thing says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. This is Jesus himself speaking. I know your works, your tribulations, and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but they are synagogues of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to what? suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. 10 days is not literally 10 days. It means a time that is full. 10 always means full time. Fullness of time. That's why you have 10 commandments. That's why there were 10 plagues in the land. It's just a, a, a figure of speech for you have tribulation for the fullness of time. That may be years. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Tribulation, pressure, suffering, hardship, difficulties. They were a reality to the Christians, just as they are reality to us today. Some of you listening to me, you are probably going through your own suffering right now. Some of you listening to me, you are probably going through your own tribulation. Some of you say, well, Pastor, thank God. I was going through it, but God has delivered me. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor, I just haven't experienced anything like that. Just wait a little while. It's still coming. None of us can escape it. For those going through it right now, they know exactly what I'm saying. For those going through some kind of pressure, or they have been going through some pressure before now, and they have been praying, and they have been waiting on the Lord, they say, Pastor, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so it is a reality to you. It is, especially if you are a genuine Christian, it is a reality that we suffer in our work with God. But you know what? God does not deny the reality of our sufferings. God doesn't deny it. That's why Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of right now, they cannot be compared to what is coming, but there is suffering right now. I want to tell you this morning, no matter what you may be going through, or no matter what you have gone through, or no matter what is going to come your way, even as a child of God, you do not and you must not despair. You know why? Because there is another reality. As real as your sufferings may be, as real as your pain may be, as real as your pressure may be, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says there is another thing that will still be real, even more real, and that is glory. Hallelujah. The glory that is coming is more real than the pressure you are under right now. The glory that is coming, if God beat God and we know his work and all that, he says, I want you to know, if you are my child, if you serve me, the glory that is coming will be more real than the problems that you have faced. Hallelujah. 
Romans chapter 8 verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What is the glory that is coming? Let's look at it in those few verses of Romans. Number one, if you are a child of God, if you stand in God, if you go through all the challenges of life, one, one you are going to inherit everything that God has together with Jesus Christ. No matter what you don't have right now, or whatever you may have lost, the Bible is telling us that hang on and hold on because the glory that is coming will bring an inheritance to you like nothing on earth that you may be desiring and not have. Look at it, verse 16 and 17. The Spirit, Romans chapter 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together with him. We are going to inherit the best of God's creation. I want you to know, God tells us that the best of God is yet to be seen. The best of what God has created, no matter what you have seen on earth, the most beautiful places, the most beautiful homes, the most beautiful people, the, the richest people, God says, wait a minute, I still have what you haven't seen. I still have a creation that is yet to be manifested. And because you are sons of God, God says they will belong to you and to me, regardless of what we are looking after and looking for right now, and we're not able to get. The Spirit tells us we are heirs. We are inheritors of all that God has. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. And all that is going to be there is going to be yours if you are a child of God. So what God is saying is, child, don't worry about the pressure you are going, on, going through now. I know the tribulations. I know the lack. I know the difficulty. But I told you when I was going, I was going to prepare a new place for you. And when I come and I take you, everything that belongs to God will belong to you. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 21. We're going to read seven verses here. Revelation chapter 21. I want you to go with me as I move uh, rather quickly through these verses. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first heaven has passed away. Also, there was no more sea. I paused. The first thing is that one of the things coming your way, if you're a child of God, if you can just go through those challenges, if you can just, just take your place and dig your heels in, no matter what you're going through, the Bible says a new. New means brand new. It means unused. It means it's not like the one we're currently in. It means you have not even seen it before. It's not a refurbished heaven. It's not a refurbished earth. A new creation that God just made that is still heart a, a mint condition is coming i saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down because the first earth this present one will pass away also there was no more sea verse 2 then i john saw the holy city the new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride are done for her husband. It's not this Jerusalem that there are bombings. God says, no, 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 forget about that. A new Jerusalem is coming for the sons of God. ISIS have no place there. All the problems that are on earth have no place there. That's why Paul is saying, the glory that is coming for us, there's no way I'm going to compare the suffering that is present with that. There is no way. Now, let's keep reading. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. You know what? The Bible says part of our inheritance is God, 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 not somebody that looks like God. God that you cannot see in that new heaven is going to be with us. He 
himself, not an angel. Now, when somebody sleeps and says, well, I had a dream and I, I, in, or in my vision I saw an angel and I was so scared. God says, forget about that. What I have in stock for all children of God is I will be with you in that new heaven and a new earth. The Bible says he will be our God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crime. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things brand new. That is what God has planned if you are his child. And so that's why he says, uh, don't worry, hang on there, stick to it. Whatever challenges you are going through, don't worry about that because I have gone to create a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. There will be nothing called sorrow. There is nothing called disappointment. There is nothing called prayer. We don't need prayer anymore. Not, not to talk of prayer that have not been answered. You don't even need prayer because God is going to be right there. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more debt. There is no mortgage to pay. There is no car notes to pay. There is no insurance to get. There is nothing like that. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. That's why Paul said, the suffering I'm going through, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've, I've been stoned. I will never compare that with the glory that is coming. Hallelujah. Verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write for this, write for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the foundation of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit how many things? If you're looking. How many things? That's why I said, whatever you don't have now, don't let that kill you. Because you are going to inherit, it's like right now, somebody tells you you are the, you are the lost son or lost daughter of you know, the richest man in the world, you'll be so happy because, no, no, God says no. You're going to inherit all things are going to be yours for eternity. But they're not going to be old, raggedy things. Uh, you know, when you buy a house and somebody has lived in there for 10 years, or even if you build your own house and the, the hand and the fingerprint of all the builders are there, God says no, 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 it's going to be the ones made from heaven. You're going to inherit all things. All things. And I will be what? I will be his God and he shall be my son. That is the glory that is coming if you are a child of God. So Paul was not out of his mind. When he was going through the sufferings. Because all he was doing is, he said, I know, this is just like you're preparing for those board exams. Or you're preparing to, you know, go through your education and become a doctor or become a lawyer or whatever. And you're going through all the difficulties because after that is either money is coming or money and prestige is coming. You don't mind to pay the price because at the end they call you surgeon this or they call you, you know, doctor this or they call you lawyer this or whatever. You say, well, I'm going to go through the sleepless nights because money and prestige is coming. That's why God is saying, if you're a child of God, yes, there is suffering now. It's a reality, but go through it because there is glory at the end of it. You're going to inherit all things. So what is it that you're going through? That you're saying, oh, God, God hasn't answered this prayer. God is not doing this for me. God is not doing that for me. God said, reality is that my people go through suffering. Did Jesus not go through suffering? The Bible says Jesus went through suffering, but he endured it because, you know, after the suffering, his name will be the only name above all names. So he said, oh, I'm going to go through the cross because he will be exalted. He said, you follow Jesus in your sufferings. Don't let anybody tell you that once you become a Christian, there is not going to be suffering. It's a lie. It's not what the Bible says. Now, that doesn't mean we should be looking for suffering all over the place. No, we are told to pray. God, deliver us from temptation. Deliver us from the devil. End the suffering. We must pray that God should end it. But that is our responsibility. It is God's decision to end it at whatever time he wants to end it. Because he says it is part of the package. But what I want you to know is whether I end it soon or I end it later, there is glory that will not end for you. If you can just make it to the side of glory. He said, he that overcomes, overcomes what? The present suffering. What happened to he that doesn't overcome the present suffering and they miss out on all things and they lose all things? 
So if you're going through and you're a child of God, God said, I wrote to you in my letter, you have to overcome first. Because only if you can overcome, all things are going to be yours. The new heaven is going to be yours. The new earth is going to be yours. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Look at what Jesus says. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, that's me and you, come you blessed of my father. Inherit the leftover of the Gentiles. Is that what it says? Inherit what? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from where? From the foundation of the world. If you are a believer, there is a kingdom waiting for you. Christianity is just not coming to church so you can be a good person. Well, that's good. But God says, open your mind. It's greater than that. I prepare a kingdom for you. Even though you are going through suffering now, the glory is a reality. God cannot lie. It is the devil that lies to us. It's the devil that tells us, well, you know, I mean, look at all that you're going through. If God really, really, really loves you, you think he's going to allow you to go through it, it's because he doesn't want you to realize what God has said about what has been prepared for you. Number two, after inheriting all things, we are going to be glorified together with Jesus. Now, this blows my mind. This is mind-boggling when you think about what it means. We are going to be glorified together with Jesus. Romans chapter 8, let's read that verse 16 and 17 one more time. Romans chapter 8. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Now watch this. If truly we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together with him. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange things happen to you, but rejoice. Now, watch this to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. What the scripture is saying is that if you are a partaker of his suffering, for sure you're going to be a partaker of his glory. Did you know that Jesus actually said we are going to sit with him on his throne? Now, I'm not making this up. Jesus said, if you are a believer, if he grants you the grace to overcome, part of the bullies, part of the dividends is you are going to sit, you are going to sit with Christ on his throne. Let me show it to you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, 21. Let's read it together. To him who fails. Is that what it says? No. Overcome what? The present suffering. I will grant to do what? Sit with me. Do you believe it? That's what Jesus said. No, no, no. When I think about it, I mean, I've read this before and I'm like, is Jesus really just exaggerating here. I'm going to sit with him on his throne. Me? That's what he said. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as also as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What can you compare with that? So you are going through some headaches now. Jesus says, don't worry. Don't you see what I said I'm going to do for you? Everybody is passing you by right now. And they say, well, see you later. Look at my tail light. Jesus says, don't worry yourself about that. If you overcome your challenges, if you stick to what I, I, I allow you to go through, you get to sit with me and rule on my throne. That is the glory. That is the glory. So what is it that you're going through? It cannot be compared with the glory that God has before you. That is all the more reason you have to overcome. 
The devil wants you to give out and give in and give up and quit so you can lose what is ahead of you. The devil wants to tell you that God doesn't love you. The devil wants to tell you that, well, the Bible is not true because if it was true, God would have delivered me from all my problems the, the very day I started calling. And God says, no, 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 no. You go back through the scripture. Go back. Go back there. I haven't changed. Did Abraham not have any problem? Oh, yes. Not only was his, his, his wife barren for years, he had family crisis. Because while he was waiting for God, he made some mistakes. He took the wrong step. And now he had a mess on his head on top of what he already had on his head. You think it was easy for Abraham to look at Hagar and say, well, you and the only child that ever came out of my body, God said, you need to go. Because that's not the plan of God. So problems, they had their own shame. Isaac's wife was barren for 20 years, 20 years. He was praying. Isaac, look at Jacob, you don't even want to start with him. For 21 years, he was a fugitive to his own brother from home. He was living in a foreign land. He went through problem after problem. He got to Laban, and Laban was just manipulating him over and over and over, and he was praying, God, but you said, I'm a child of covenant. I'm carrying the blessing of Abraham. Is this what the blessing of Abraham looks like? So just count all of them. Moses, you want to talk about Moses? 40 years, he was a fugitive, running from Pharaoh. 40 years, from age 40 to 80. God abandoned him as it were. There is no voice. There is not even a pin drop sound from heaven. Yet, when he was 80, God manifested himself. And God said, get up. The program now is going to just start. So there is nobody you can look at in the scripture. They went through their own problem. I just read to you the, the, the resume, the experience of Paul. You will not even want to take one of his experiences, but he had all of them, and he said, still, I don't care what they have. They cannot compare with the glory ahead of me, so I gladly go through them. Don't let the devil deceive you. Don't let the devil tell you that uh, God doesn't love you. God says, so, so I didn't love Abraham. Is that what it is? The present suffering is real to you, but the glory that is coming... It's going to swallow up your suffering. Amen. Hallelujah. If we endure, we shall reign with him. One other thing that really is interesting to me is that we're going to be like Jesus. Our body is actually going to be transformed. You're going to get a new body. You are going to get a new body. That's what the Bible says. Because we're going to be transformed into the heavenly body like Jesus. The package is too sweet to miss. Just too much. Look at um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. They don't know Jesus. They don't know God. That's why they don't know us. Beloved, now, that's the key word, now we are children of God. But, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, Jesus, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We are going to be in his form when he comes for us. First Corinthians chapter 15 says we shall be changed. He says there is one body that can work for the terrestrial, that is the earth. He said, but the, there is a celestial body, a completely different kind of body that Jesus has in the heavens. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you and I will be changed. We will drop off this decaying mortal body and we take on a new body. That's why the Bible says we are going to be like him and we are going to be in the form of Jesus. So he said, you have sickness in your body. Don't bother too much about that. Pray for healing. But if I'm not healing you yet, or even if I decide I'm not going to heal it's not the body you're going to use forever because I'm going to change that body. You're going to leave that body here or not because it cannot come to heaven with you. I'm going to transform it and give you a new body. You are called children of God now, but then you are going to be like Jesus in his own body. The sufferings you are going through, financial suffering, don't let it weigh you down. Bodily suffering, don't let it weigh you down. 
family situations, don't let it weigh you down. So you don't have to lose your joy because of the present suffering. Don't lose your joy because of this present situation. If you are a child of God. Now, there are things that our sins can bring on us. There are things that our disobedience can bring on us. But if we are people that love God, if we are people that, 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 that place our faith in God, and we are still going through difficulties, God said, I know all about it. Even if you are a child of God and you have sinned and the sin has brought a problem and now you have returned to God, God says, I got that covered too. But you have to overcome that situation. Hallelujah. So my encouragement to us today, I'll finish this up next time. Don't lose your joy because of your present suffering. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Don't, don't, don't think it strange. My, my family is not all together, but Lord, I serve you. God says, don't let that be strange to you. Others, other people have seen it. Lord, but, but I, I pay my tithe, but my finances is nothing to write home about. He said, don't think it as if it's a strange thing. Quit thinking about it as if it's strange. Do not think it's strange about the trial, the fiery trial that will try you as though some strange things happen to you. That's what the devil is telling you. But God says, it's not strange. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Second thing I'm going to mention, not only should you not lose your joy, resist the devil. Don't let the devil lie to you. So what the devil likes to do is, God doesn't love you. If he loves you, there is no way he's going to allow this to happen to you. It's a lie of the devil. And God says, resist him. First Peter chapter 5, verse 9. See what it says? Resist him steadfast in the faith. Money is not coming. Stand in the faith. Problem is not solving. Stand in the faith. Your body is not responding. Stand in the faith. Resist the lie of the devil. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. God is saying, all my children have their own moment of suffering, but I promise them glory after the suffering. Don't you quit in your faith. You know many people, the reason they can't pray anymore it's just the weight of the problem is too much. So, oh Lord, I don't even know what to pray. I prayed everything they've told me to pray. I prayed everything I found in the Bible. Every pastor has prayed for me. Every evangelist has prayed for me. Every prophet has prayed for me. And nothing has happened. I don't need, know what to, I don't. I give up on prayer. If God wants to answer, well, one day when he remembers you. He says, stand in the faith and resist the devil. Know that the same suffering is expressed by your brother. Who is, that? is your brother? All the believers, Paul, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Peter, every one of them. He said they went through all of it together. So why, why are you going to quit? Lord, I'm a lady and I'm 35 and there's no husband. So... I don't think I'm going to serve you anymore because if you cannot provide me a, a husband that is godly, match.com will help me. God says, don't quit. That's the lie of the devil. If I not get, cannot get somebody to marry me, then, you know, hey, I wanted to keep my body holy, but now, God, you have put me in a situation that I have to do what I have to do. God says, resist the devil. He's lying to you. He's lying to you. God, if you really love me, ah, ah, you should have solved this. Don't you see the embarrassment I'm going through? God says, resist the devil. It's the devil that is lying to you. You cannot compare the glory that is coming 
with the suffering that is present. If you overcome, let's stand up on our feet. We're going to pray.